What's really good, everybody? This is Nathan Auerbach, and welcome to the podcast where we get into people's stories and go down a bunch of rabbit holes about what's really good in the world. For today's episode, I had the incredible opportunity to chat with Zoltan Istvan. Zoltan is a former reporter for National Geographic and is now a journalist, author, futurist, and one of the leading voices in the transhumanist movement. How's that for a string of titles? (laughs) Oh yeah, and he actually ran for president in 2016 and is now running for governor of California in 2018 under the Libertarian Party. So yeah, in our conversation, we got all into that. We tackled what transhumanism is, and we addressed a lot of the concerns that I think most of us have revolving around these topics. I was really grateful for the chance to speak with Zoltan, especially after following his work and features on the Joe Rogan Experience, Huffington Post, Vice, and a ton of other huge outlets. So I hope you all enjoy and take something cool from this. Now let's get into what's really good. Zoltan, thank you for coming on the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right, so let's just lay some uh, quick groundwork out for people who don't have a total grasp on what exactly it is that you do. So for those who don't know, what is transhumanism and what got you into it? Well, transhumanism is what I believe uh, you know, tens of millions of people around the world I want to use science and technology to radically modify the human being and also to modify the uh, human experience. And it's a social movement. It's a social movement of all those people that want to do those things. So what got you into that? I mean, it's not exactly something that, you know, just the average layperson would hear about or jump into, you know, from the get-go. So what was it that got you into it? Well, you know, I've always been interested in science and technology ever since I was a kid, read a lot of sci-fi um, at school, I read a article on cryonics, and it really just cryonics is where you freeze your body in hopes to be brought back um, alive sometime in the future when the technology and the medicine is there. And um, I, I became a convert. I said, wow, this is the greatest thing I ever heard about. You can overcome death through science, and I want to dedicate my life to it. But it wasn't really until I was um, uh, working at National Geographic and had a pretty crazy incident with a landmine in Vietnam on assignment that made me say, wow, I should actively be contributing to the movement and not just support the movement. And so uh, after that incident, I wrote a novel, The Transhumanist Wager, and that has sort of uh, launched a public career in the transhumanist movement itself, uh, now followed up by presidential campaigns and governor runs and everything else. Yeah, yeah. Dude, that is, that's insane. <laughs> is, so would you say, like, with that experience that you had, how much of, like, a you know, the sort of primordial fear of death and just sort of the, the temporary nature of life, how much of that plays in to this whole um, ideology? Well, you know, I, I just, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't like death. I, I don't know if, uh, <laughs> it just, I'm a, I'm a secular person or an atheist, and I simply don't believe that there's an afterlife, or, or I'm more really agnostic. I just don't know. Yeah, but yeah. I simply don't want to find out and then all of a sudden be nothing and be eaten by worms. So for me, I believe in transhumanism simply because it gives me a chance to try to overcome death and guarantee that I can live indefinitely. And that's really what it's about to me. It's just like I love life and I don't want to die. And because I don't believe in an afterlife, I want to do something about not dying now. And in fact, that's kind of the crux of my novel, The Transhumanist Wager. Instead of Pascal's wager, you make a transhumanist wager. And the wager is that you can use science and technology to live indefinitely. Yeah, I think that like that whole notion freaks a lot of people out just on its face value since we do live in, you know, in, at least in Western culture, we live with this uh, like a Judeo-Christian value system. And, you know, we kind of, as a culture, look at death, you know, like it is not, ne- not necessarily that it's final, but that it's necessary and that sort of the the cycle of life, the passing of, you know, we go through life and die and then everything sort of recycles itself. So there's a lot of, um, at least it, what I've seen, just apprehension from people to try to control that cycle. You know, have you run into any of that, like any controversy or any debates dealing with people, like with sort of you, this whole idea that we're trying to control 
our outcome, like controlled death. Oh, of course. I mean, that, you know, and, and that's the big thing between difference between transhumanists and I guess the rest of <laughs> mostly the world. You know, the, a bit about uh, five, six or four fifths of the world, majority of them mm-hmm. are, are religious and believe in an afterlife. And they simply think that the human body is what it was because it was created by a maker. And um, it's, it's natural and it's not to be tampered with. But transhumanists don't believe in this word natural. They think, well, there's nothing natural. Natural is whatever you can do with subatomic particles in whichever way you can modify and manipulate it. And, you know, subatomic particles make up the brain, make up the body, make up existence. So if we, with scientific tools, can start changing those things, why not change it, especially if it improves our lives? And it's really, you know, that's the crux of the problem is that a lot of people don't want to mess with what they consider humanity or the naturalness of the human being. But transhumanists just as naturally see themselves as robots in 100 years as they see themselves as biological entities now. We just don't see the difference. I, I don't believe in this word natural. Yeah, it's it is, natural's really become this sort of buzzword where I, I, it's sort of that people equate it with the word good. You know, they believe that natural equals good. You, know, you see it especially in health food and medicine and how, you know, people, they look to things that are all natural, but you're right. I mean, when you sort of extrapolate the definition, I mean, we, everything that we create comes from the resources on earth. Like, this is, we are creating things from nature and, you know, we do it in a lab, which I think freaks people out a little bit, but, you know, this all does sort of fall right in line with with what it, sort of the natural uh, direction that we're going forward. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. And, and the you know, the, the big issue is I know people think it's natural. Yes, it's very natural to have kids and very natural to enjoy life and be happy. But then when someone gets in a terrible car accident, it's not very natural that they die, especially an excruciating death. Malaria doesn't seem very natural when your child is dying from it. And then you have to just point out that it's really science and technology that is aiming to eliminate suffering. If suffering's natural, then who cares? I don't want to be a part of suffering. I don't like suffering, you know. And But this is a huge cultural shift. Again, it kind of goes back to whether you believe in an afterlife, because if you don't believe in an afterlife, then you see no reason to suffer during this life. Um, But if you believe in an afterlife, then you're like, well, I can deal with a little bit of suffering in this life. So again, for me, it's so much of a religious question on uh, a spiritual question, I too, I suppose. And I think um, my job as a communicator in transhumanism is really to try to tell people that, you know, whether you believe in God or not, or an afterlife or not, transhumanism still will eliminate suffering. And that's a good thing, whether you like suffering or not, it's a good thing to eliminate. Most people don't, of course. Yeah, yeah, that, that's really cool. So, like, yeah, let's get into some of the, I guess, the platforms of what it exactly is to be a transhumanist. So, you ran for president in 2016, correct? Yes, yes, I was the nominee of the Transhumanist Party in 2016. So, from there, you know, I mean, and you had spoken openly about this that you know the goal was never to win you know like it was it's one of those things we we each kind of get the idea how difficult it is to 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 sort of break up the u.s uh, political system but the goal is to spread awareness and to sort of jump start you know this whole movement into politics for you because now in 2018 you're running for governor so what let's let's get into that a little bit just your platforms um i, I saw that you're running as a libertarian so what is the sort of, um, how does a transhumanist ideology fit in with uh, libertarianism, and just what are some of the platforms surrounding this whole run that you're doing? Well, sure, libertarian transhumanism is definitely a thing. It's this idea that, you know, government should stay out of science, and that capitalism motivates science and innovation better than really any other economic form or economic pressure out there. And, you know, this is the, it it doesn't matter what technology you talk about, if you (laughs) innovate something, the government, like, wants to get its hands in there, pay taxes, whatnot. And so I'm saying, as a libertarian gubernatorial candidate, you know, I just want less government and more science and innovation. And that's really what my gubernatorial candidacy is all about. But of course, I have normal libertarian platforms. I want you to pay less taxes. Uh, I want uh, more freedoms. I want uh, more transparency with the government and those kinds of things. And I also am very socially liberal, which is very typical of transhumanists and 
and typical of libertarians. You know, we believe strongly in LGBT rights. We believe strongly in the, the privacy of your own body to make your own choices about it, what you want to do with it. And um, <clears throat> these are all platforms of mine, both as a libertarian, as a transhumanist. I, I usually just say I'm a libertarian transhumanist because the word has become so common now. Yeah. And uh, I think that's, um, that's, uh, you know, really what the platform is about. But I'll tell you, the number one thing in my platform, just for your listeners, is called a federal land dividend or what we call a libertarian version of a basic income. I'm a complete believer that automation and robots are going to be coming soon for everybody's jobs in the next 10, 20, and 30 years. And that the economy is going to change dramatically because people are out of work because of automation. And I think a basic income is a way to combat that and make it sure, sure that everybody has a roof over their head and enough food to eat and whatnot. And um, my federal land dividend uh, uses federal, empty federal land, of which we have about $200 trillion worth approximately in America. And um, it, it uses that land, leases that land to pay everybody in America and everybody, especially in California, a basic income. And um, that's, uh, that's really one of my main platforms. I'm kind of the only, um, I suppose, main gubernatorial candidate that's running on a basic income platform. Yeah, I was going to ask you about uh, UBI. So maybe just to give the listeners a little bit more education on it, can you explain what universal basic income is? And you, can you sort of extrapolate a little bit on how that fits into the libertarian position? Because I know it's sort of uh, at its face value. It's sort of for a lot of people when they hear about it, they sort of think mass welfare. You know, they think, you know, this is it's more of like a socialist idea. So can you talk about like how universal basic income fits in with the uh, transhumanist libertarian uh, idea? Well, absolutely. And, and so, you know, first off, a universal basic income is an income that's paid to every single, let's say, American, every single person in America. And um, it's supposed to, you know, be right or take you to at least so you're right at a point when you can have afford housing, even if it's just a small apartment, afford food afford to live your life without needing to work. And the reason that universal basic income has become so popular recently is because there is this trend to have jobs be taken by machines. And that trend's only accelerating and to get worse and worse and worse. Now, most libertarians wouldn't favor such a system of a basic income, and I, I don't really favor it, just an outright basic income, because generally speaking, the only way to pay for universal basic income is to raise taxes. Until um, this last year, when I came out with my policy of this federal land dividend, which, you know, basically America, as I said, is sitting on um, $200 trillion worth of federal land. Most of it is unused. You know, California, for example, has enormous amounts of coastal land, beautiful coastal land. It's worth 3 to $5 trillion. And we're preserving it because the environmentalists say, well, we should preserve it for thousands and thousands of generations of Californians from now. And the problem is that, you know, with the transhumanist age, I don't think there's going to be another generation even beyond my children because of the way people either merge with machines or the, the evolution of the microprocessor. You know, transhumanism is starting to already take over. I mean, we're going to have to have our brains connected directly to the internet, to the cloud in the next five to 10 years to actually be able to even be competitive against robots. And this is like, I'm talking 10 year window here. So I don't believe in the thousand year generation for America anymore. So what I believe, though, is paying people a basic income by monetizing that that empty federal land that America is holding, literally a fortune, and paying a basic income. And in this way, we have a bipartisan creation where we solve the poverty issue in America, which is widespread. But the republic and the Democrats like that. But the Republicans like the federal land dividend also because it increases the opportunities for big business. And of course, libertarians like it because in the end of the day, how you, <laughs> what happens with basic income is basic income swallows all the other social services that the government has. It takes away food stamps, it takes away social security, it takes away uh, health care and all this other stuff. And it puts it into one simple basic income. So it actually does shrink government influence in your life. And I think that's... Um, that's really the allure of the basic income and why some libertarians like myself support various versions of it. Yeah, I know a lot of um, the tech people in Silicon Valley have been pushing this for a long time. Mainly, it seems that mainly because, you know, they have such stake in the game where these are the people innovating this futurist technology and they they know well ahead of the rest of us how it's going to be taking jobs from the average working Americans and putting them into machines. And as that happens, you know, more and more workers, you know, I've, I've heard you talk about, 
I think it was uh, the truck drivers in America that make up, male truck drivers make up something between five and seven million jobs. And once automated cars come into place, you know, those, are, those people are out of a job and they've been working in that career field for their entire lives. So what will people like that do once automation you know, continues to take over these different workplaces? But, you know, li- listening to, like, you kind of get into a lot of these ideas, I think for people listening on the outside that aren't too familiar just with all of this as a whole, I think there's a tendency to think of it as sort of an elitist ideology. You know, like, there's people look at this like, okay, well, you know, this guy, he's standing for these platforms, and, of course, you know, these certain people, like, these tech type of people, they want to push this because all the power is going to go to the top and that the idea like the whole it's almost like trickle down economics you know like they kind of look at it in this cynical lens you know like we're just going to keep pushing all the power and the influence to these tech giants and that the average people it's going to be a long time from now before they ever get their hands on this technology and these uh opportunities so can you get into that a little bit and just kind of like give your side to that perspective well you know i I mean some people believe that automation will take over all the jobs and some people don't. And I I simply believe that it will just because I live in Silicon Valley and I'm seeing essentially what's happening. It's, um, you know, there's no question that these things are going to do this. And um, I think ultimately speaking, the, um, you know, the, the bottom line is that this is in our best interest. We can create a techno utopia world where everybody has enough resources, enough food, enough shelter, enough whatever, and a dramatically larger amount of free time. But in order to avoid the civil strife, it's going to be a bit of a, a, a kind of, um, you know, it, it's going to be a transition moment where we all have to be very careful and take some time. And as you know, it, it's not this is not a very popular subject. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton didn't want to talk about these things. They talked about immigrants taking jobs. They talked about the workforce changing, blah, blah. But they never talk about the single reason it's changing. Yeah, yeah. And it's not immigrants that are taking jobs. I mean, this is very simple. Capitalism is being challenged by very, very rich technology corporations that ultimately have it in their best interest to literally replace every single one of us and just have companies that have maybe like a board of directors that make a ton of cash. And that is an incredibly challenging situation. I think um, that's something that's going to absolutely, um, you know, have to be addressed in a real way. And it'll probably be addressed in a real way. You know, I mean, at some point they're going to have to say, hey, the world has to change. We better um, we better do this. Otherwise, there's going to be civil war and there will be pitchforks. It's it's a it's a totally uh, it's inevitable, I think. Yeah, this, it seems like this part of the conversation, it really it's it's almost odd how how far outside of the mainstream political conversation that it is, because it really is. We all see it creeping up. You know, if you've paid any attention to what what people like Elon Musk have been doing, you know, what Jeff Bezos have been doing, like what what these tech giants have been accomplishing the past five, ten years. I mean, this stuff has been ramping up at an insane rate. And it really is crazy just to watch, you know, like people, I I think it's part of it maybe is that people don't really want to get into it because it sort of taps into that really fear-based uh, mindset that we've been watching and witnessing through like pop culture for for decades now. You know, no- in novels with sci-fi novels and uh, movies like iRobot. You know, you get you, there's sort of this like piece of our culture that has been touching on this for decades, and now that it's slowly becoming a reality, you know, mainstream doesn't really want to acknowledge how much it really is just creeping into the sphere of things. Oh, yeah, and, and that, that's very sad because what we do, as we always do in this country, is we wait till it just hits us, and then it becomes a full-scale revolution. And, uh, you know, I mean, automation is going to be as big of an issue as civil rights. I mean, there will be fights on the street. There will be clashes. There will be demonstrations. There will probably be people killed. I mean, we're talking about 300, you know, well, at least at 150 million Americans, jobs literally being challenged. And um, that's not something you just push underneath the rug. I mean, we're, we're coming to an era when the world is going to be um, challenged, challenged yeah. dramatically. 
Yeah, definitely. So I don't I don't want to go this whole conversation without uh, touching up on the chip that you have implanted in you because I think this is fascinating and it's it seems to touch up on uh, just this whole sci-fi fear. You know, that in and of itself is really one of those portions of this where people people have been saying this for years now like oh no like the government is going to implant chips in all of us and they're going to know everything and it's sort of been a uh, dr- dramatized over the years so do you want to get into like your experience and getting this implant and like what it's done for your life and sort of your perception of it well yeah so i have you know a small rfid chip inside my hand um it's the size of a grain of rice and um it opens my front door. It can do all sorts of other things. Send you a text message when you come too close to me if you have the right software. And it can, of course, start your car and other things like that. And, you know, the funny thing is it's already two and a half, three years old. Now it's um, basically obsolete. <laughs> like, you need wow. the newer version. <laughs> and that's the problem. It's like it goes in really easy. It goes in through a syringe. Like I said, it's the size of a grain of rice. It goes yeah. in through a syringe. Um, the problem is now you got to cut it out and put in another one. And, um that's how fast technology is kind of growing. But the new ones allow you to pay in certain circumstances. And I think eventually they're going to allow us to pay like at Starbucks and places like that. And, you know, when you think about it, if you have kids like me, your kids never can hide your keys. If you're a surfer like me, you never need to um, take your, uh, you know, your keys and hide them underneath your car or put them in the water in your wetsuit. And the same thing, you go jogging, you just don't need to carry these things. And I think um, uh, implants like that will eventually rival uh, potentially even cell phones where we'll have them just because they they do half the things your cell phone does except you can never lose it it's so insane it's like it's like you're living in an episode of black mirror to me i still i don't know anybody with a chip so it's so crazy to hear you it's so it's well, such a casual like it's been for years now it's been going on yeah yeah and it's it's growing like you know i think this year there's going to be around eighty thousand. i mean last year it was forty thousand people had got them installed and wow. i think it's pretty much doubling every year and a lot of it now there's a couple other companies one in europe so now it's also gone across the 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 ocean and you know i'm it's uh, yeah. I think I think uh, it, it, we're talking. There, there's a lot of very practical reasons to do it. Like I said, uh, it's nice to go jogging and not have to take my car keys, uh, or or my, or my car key, you know, any keys, and just have it there. And I can't wait to go to Starbucks and just put my hand by the reader and not have to, you know, I can forget my wallet. I mean, how many times we all forget our wallet? Oh yeah, all the time. And then we have to go back and. It, same thing. This can contain your identification. Some people have already put it on the, their passport onto it. You can get onto trains in Amsterdam with it um, by scanning it. So slowly as it becomes adopted uh, everywhere, it's going to become very useful. And again, it's a tiny, tiny implant. It's uh, But, you know, eventually I hopefully will have much bigger ones, uh, you know, much more complex ones in our bodies that read our bo- read our blood, tell us if we're getting the flu, tell us what kind of foods we need to eat. I mean, really monitor our health and help us on a daily basis and also maybe even tell us directions and things like that. I mean, it's unlimited what these things can do. It's, you know, eventually your, your cell phone is going to be so small, it's going to be the size of one of these implants and basically be operating from your hand and maybe through holographic imaging, that's how you'll use your cell phone or something. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, for people, again, just for the lay person listening to this and hearing, it, it sort of sounds crazy to think, oh, man, this guy's got a chip implanted in his body. For, from a, like a national security or a personal security standpoint, is the sort of um, likelihood or ability of hacking something like this, like, do you know if right now is it around the same probability of something like hacking an iPhone? Like, what is the security like for it? And what are some of these concerns that you've been addressing, you know, as as obviously someone who has one. Well, right now, the hackability of it is very minor. And just so you know, the, the implant I have doesn't actually even have any battery power. What the implant does is it responds to all sorts of outside uh, devices. And that's how it works. Um, with your car, you know, it, it, it doesn't actually like fit in anywhere or send any out any signals. It's the car that's sending out the signals. And then you're like, you have a receiver and then you send the signal back and it says, oh, this is the guy who, you know, can start my car. And that's the kind of great thing about it is it's really hard to hack at the moment. Um, But it's also, for that reason, somewhat difficult to track. And frankly, a lot of people want trackability. But right now, the chips – and and I know that sounds bad. You're like, oh, I don't want to be tracked. But imagine if you want to send your child to school, first day of public school. It might make sense to be able to track her for safety reasons. Or you know, the same thing can be said during school shootings and whatnot. It's a lot easier during emergencies to have these kinds of things. So I have advocated for people – considering implants as a means of trackability, um, 
I know there's total privacy concerns. I know it doesn't sound very libertarian, but my God, from health concerns and functionality concerns, it's way, way advantageous. And I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it just takes off in a major way here in the next few years. But right now, the trackability of them is next to none because you have to really be within a four or five feet range. Okay, some of them, the new ones can be within 10 or 20 feet. They can track you. But that means there has to be some type of responder that sees you and then sends that back to the machine and says, okay, this person is here. Right now, that's nearly impossible because so many, so few places actually use this type of technology. Yeah, that's so fascinating. It, it really, it seems like, you know, with a lot of these technolo- technological advances that a lot of the apprehension people have is really, like, from, from people's apprehension in uh, sort of, uh, division compared to your pro stance, you know, it, it's almost, it reminds me of Tesla cars where, you know, like when smart cars started getting on the road, people were so afraid of, you know, these self-driving cars. And anytime, you know, in the beginning, there's like a minor accident or something happens where, where it malfunctions or whatever, people freak out and it's all over the front pages and, oh, we, we told you something was going to happen. But you know, as we see, it's like the broad scope of people driving these things that they're overwhelmingly more safe and that it's overwhelmingly overwhelmingly, you know, a net good, which I think is kind of like what all this revolves around is that, you know, as this technology increases, there's going to be bumps along the way and like figuring out, you know, what are the best ways to go about implants and et cetera. But there's, it, at the end of the day, this is just sort of the direction it's going. So with that said, you know, like all this, the, the transhumanism ideology, it's all about tech, technology moving forward. So do you see any, like, I guess for me personally, like I work in social media, so I mean, I'm online all day and I see, and you don't even have to be online to see this, but you see the sort of continual polarization between people, like politically, socially, ideologically, and it almost seems like that part of society is getting worse while the technology is getting better. So do you see like that coming to a head at some point? Like, like you talked about like potential violence erupting in the streets. Like, are there any ways, you know, looking ahead at that, like that we could curb it, that we could sort of, you know, use technology to better our communication and better our society, you know, sort of to get things in line? Huh. Well, you know, the, the, the problem is really that, um, Social media has made the world crazy, and I'm I'm really a little bit disappointed with communications methods that technology has made. And pro- part of the problem is that it used to be that only really, I guess, together wealthy or you know educated or whatnot people had a voice in the public. And now because of social media, anybody has a voice in the public, and they go out. And generally speaking, some people that like to rant speak much more loudly than those who should actually have their voice out in public. And as a result, it's very difficult to hear through the noise. I think, though, after the elections with Trump, there's going, you know, and I I know Google and Facebook are now starting to change their algorithms saying, okay, wow, fake news is is more than just um, uh, this term. I mean, this is really real. We're changing culture and we're not changing it for the better. I think they're going to get a handle on that. Their algorithms are going to be able to figure out what's a lie, what's not, and they're going to downplay the lies and upplay the truth and what's much more, I think, you know, more solid for society to know. And I think that will help. You have to understand that social media is like the wild, wild west right now. Yeah. There are all these things out there. Anyone can say whatever they want. I mean, even just to yesterday, that big, big news came through that Trump can't block people on Twitter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, that we're we're discovering you know, I think what happened is five years ago, everyone said, oh, my God, this social media, we're all on it. This is our main way of communicating, our way, main way of getting press. So we're discovering how to deal with that. And I think it's going to get better. I know right now it, it seems like a, a huge amount of crazy people are out there on the Internet in, in influencing the universe. But I think it'll come, it'll come be tamed, and hopefully technology will actually make communication better. It certainly made democracy better, but we do have to remember that you know mob democracy is also not necessarily in our best interest. Um, we need to make sure that clear and sound voices, and that we have real leaders that we want to listen to, and that they speak clearly. And I, you know, at, at some point though, I do believe the technology will help 
right now though it's it's made it like the wild west and i'm not a big fan of facebook and twitter and a lot of those other places yeah it's nuts well i, I hope you're right for all of our sakes because yeah. it really it does seem to just be devolving in so many ways as technology is evolving so de- definitely hope you're right there but um listen man i i look at you sort of like the in a way the neil degrasse tyson of uh you know transhumanism you know you're a communicator and you're trying to spread these ideas and really get the conversation in the public platform are there any leading researchers or people sort of behind the scenes like doing studies and doing work in here that you would point to for someone who wanted more resources on transhumanism and just this whole movement in general yeah, yeah. I mean, if anyone's familiar with the work of Sens or Aubrey de Grey, that he's a very important scientist, a gerontologist. They always need new new resources. They have nonprofits. I mean, if your listeners are interested, there are so many scientists out there. The Buck Institute. I mean, and so much anti aging. You know, one of the big problems with our field is just it's underfunded because the government doesn't want to fund any of it because they consider transhuman science to be very sketchy. Now. As a libertarian, I'm not big big on government funding, but I do think the government has a vested interest. If it's going to be spending money, like hell, and spending money in wars in Afghanistan, spend money on heart disease, spend money on the Alzheimer's, spend money on curing aging and things like that. So I'm a big proponent of you know reducing the military industrial complex state to a science industrial complex yeah, state. Yeah. And, you know, I, I know you could never say, oh, just get rid of the military industrial complex because our entire economy is based on it. But it doesn't have to be military oriented. It could be science oriented. And that's been one of my big campaign promises is to, to try to channel more of the money and resources directly into the health care of Americans. And I don't mean health care in like what company you get your health care from. I mean tackling diseases at the ground level by getting researchers and the organizations they work for more money so they can do more research and develop the vaccines and cures and, and just devices and whatever it is that can, I mean, cancer, we can, we can wipe out cancer with a vaccine, but we need a trillion dollars to do so. And the problem is like, that's, that's so big that it really requires some government influence there. And this is where I'm saying, like, I just want, instead of a military industrial complex, the science industrial complex would be something great. Dude, well, I really appreciate the time, Zoltan. You know, uh, one more question if you want to answer this. I mean, I was just going to say, if you had to answer, like, give an elevator pitch of why someone should get into um, transhumanism or vote transhumanism in the your libertarian party vote for California um, this this election, what would the elevator pitch be? Well, our election, primary elections, is in 10 days. So um, in our California, you have a, a first vote and then the top two make it. So you can vote for me in the next 10 days, and it doesn't even mean it's going to be your final vote. So mm. vote for me anyways, just because it'd be fun to have a, a transhumanist in the top two. But I, I think ultimately, you know, if you're interested in really a real world that wants to make your health perfect and wants to protect you from coming widespread automation, then vote for me because I'm really the only candidate that's thinking of a a basic income that actually offers, um, without really restructuring society, it isn't like super tax the rich. It doesn't tax the rich at all. It just simply can monetize land and give people money. And I think that in itself is great because then even if you are in like you work at a factory or something or you're a truck driver, or whatever, you can rest assured that somebody has been thought thinking through the process and is going to pay you so that you can survive and, and be happy um, when robots come for your jobs. And, uh, you know, really no other candidates are speaking about that yet. And, uh, you know, that's one been one of my big promises. I care about your living. I care about your livelihood. I want to make sure that you have an enjoyable life. Cool. Love it, man. This has all been super fascinating. You know, really appreciate the time. And uh, yeah, thanks for all you do. And uh, we'll catch you around, all right? Hey, thank you so much for the interview. It's been wonderful. All right. Take care, Zoltan. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>